Because I'm, I'm super excited to introduce uh, Jennifer Rexford, Jen, <laughs> as, a, as a, she allowed me to call her. Um, so she's the winner of the, um, of the ACM Athena Lecture Award. Uh, it's an Athena Lecture, and, uh, uh, which is kind of the, the touring award for women. So this is, this is a really, really big deal. Um, and, uh, but, of course, this is not the only award that she has won. She, um, she won the Grace, ACM Grace Hopper Award in 2005. She's a, an ACM fellow. She's a fellow of the American Association uh, for Arts and Sciences and a member of the uh, National Academy of Engineering. Um, so she got her PhD from the University of Michigan, as it turns out, in the same year that I got my PhD, so I'm not going to comment on that <laughs> <laughs> for protecting my own privacy. Um, and um, and then she went to industry to work with uh, uh, to work at AT and T and Bell Labs. And uh, Albert is here, and so they go go back. And uh, but of course, she has a, a number of other Microsoft relationships. So uh, her students are. Always welcome, and they <laughs> they do come, and and we're very grateful for that. Um, this is not her first talk. She gave a uh, she gave a, a summer school on networking in in India, um, and um, as I just heard, uh, she visited Victor's group uh, nine years ago. Yeah. Right um, now, after AT and T, she's now a pro on the faculty of um, of, um, uh, of Princeton, and. Um, and in her work, she's, uh, she's kind of a pioneer of uh, software-defined networks. And again, uh, and you, you're co-inventor of OpenFlow, and I have a personal history with that because when I was at ETH, we, we bought a, a huge pile of Arista um, <laughs> uh, switches, and the big defining factor was that they were OpenFlow and that we could uh, program them. Um, before that, uh, she, she also worked on PGP, um, which I also at some point taught at ETH, <laughs> so I'm, I'm there. And uh, one of the, the most interesting things, as I was uh, Googling and searching around, she has a page with all the advice uh, that she gives, like uh, PhD students and so on. And there was also one of uh, PowerPoint desks, uh, decks, which is interesting for me, which was industry versus academia. And this is my last uh, thing. You went from industry to academia, and the PowerPoint explains why. I went from academia to industry, so I'll, uh, we'll cross our, our stories later today. We'll call it tonight. Even. Yeah, okay. So, so thanks for coming, and um, yeah, and please, we're all... Thanks so much for the introduction. Yeah. Yeah, and it's great to be among so many old friends. So what I want to do is give a, a talk that I, I've given uh, at SIGCOM, our, our main networking conference, a few months ago, and it's about interdisciplinary research in computer networking. And what I want to do is give you a little bit of background of how I came into this style of research, informed a lot by my experiences at AT&T, walk through a few example projects that I've worked on since going to Princeton, and then end with some sort of advice for, for people, particularly young people, that are considering doing interdisciplinary work, both about the joys and, and some of the risks of doing that style of research, particularly from an academic perspective. Um, so. Just to kind of give a little context, I think you know we're, all of us are living in a really exciting time in computer networking. Really, the internet is an invention that escaped from the lab during our lifetimes to become a, a global communications infrastructure, going from this into a really global communications infrastructure that's increasingly critical for a, a huge number of applications that affect our daily lives. And it's not only a critical infrastructure, it's one with near constant innovation. Innovation in the applications and services that run on top, on the kinds of machines that connect to it at the edge and the kind of physical infrastructure that the network itself runs over. So society critically depends on it. It's in a constant state of churn. And so a really simple grand challenge that we really all, I think, uh, need to think about, not just as networking people, but as computer scientists broadly, is that we need to build computer networks that are worthy of the trust that society increasingly places in them. And that really, just to unpack that a little bit, means they need to be performant, they need to be reliable, secure, protect user privacy, be fair, efficient, enable the different autonomous entities on the internet to work somewhat independently, it would be cost effective, effective, and even reason about the inherent tensions between all of these goals. And so I would argue to do that, we really need to build much stronger intellectual foundations for how we design and operate networks uh, so that we can build better real-world networks and also in particular build ones that are robust to the constant innovation taking place 
above, next to, and below them. And the main point I want to make in this talk is that networking researchers really can't do this alone because the intellectual challenges are so significant and the societal implications so broad. And that's why really an interdisciplinary approach to solving these problems is so critical. And so what I want to talk about is bringing together these sort of big, hairy, audacious research problems that arise in computer networking together with effective solution techniques that borrow from other parts of computer science and other areas of, of engineering and mathematics. And this sort of style of research was something that was born out of my experiences in my, the nine years I spent in Albert's group at AT&T, where the group we were in really connected the people within the research organization doing work in algorithms, optimization, and statistics with the people that were really holding the network together, AT&T's uh, commercial backbone network together, to be able to take the problems that they were facing in their day-to-day -day lives running the network and to bring, bring those problems out of the sort of gory details and the domain details that networking people would be comfortable with into problems that could really be attacked in a rigorous way from, from other disciplines. And so in the work in Albert's lab, we, we, the work started before I joined, but I think the, the premise of a lot of the work was that the network wasn't designed to be managed, right? Internet protocols are really not designed with the network operator in mind. If anything, network management and commercial interests were anathema to the early designers of the internet. And so the idea that came out, you know, from Albert and his group really worked on was the idea that we could bolt on network management on top by having a sort of control loop for measuring the network to know uh, the offered traffic, the topology, anomalies taking place in the network, and so on, and feed that into systems that model, analyze, optimize, and so on, and use those results to go back and actually affect change in the network to block attacks, to reroute traffic, uh, to plan for the future uh, by, by following this control loop. So there was a lot of work I was involved in in the nine years I was at AT&T, and a lot of it was, was able to be both academically interesting and deployed in practice because it was sort of close to those domain details and yet abstracted a bit from them enough that we could solve them in, in more rigorous ways. So at the time that I, that I left AT&T, the, the one frustration I had with this style of work was that for good reason, we were really focusing on taking the existing network equipment as a given. This was pragmatic. We didn't really have a choice. Even AT&T, as a major purchaser of network equipment, didn't get to control the code that ran inside the box, let alone the hardware inside. And so pragmatically, it was really difficult to do much of anything if you wanted to do something that required changing the equipment. But when I went to Princeton, I was interested in taking a step back and revisiting this control loop and the problems associated with it, assuming I could change the network. And there was already at the time starting to be signs of an interest in making networks more programmable, including work that, that Albert, Dave Maltz, myself, and others worked on at AT&T that uh, was a part of this sort of great movement towards software-defined networking over the last decade. Uh, but more generally, I also just wanted to engage with a broader set of colleagues in different disciplines on problems that I hadn't been able to tackle the way I wanted because of, the, of having an arm held behind my back by the, the legacy equipment. So... What I wanted to talk about are three example projects that I worked on since coming to Princeton that kind of are part of a, a stack of protocols, if you will, for running the network. The first, looking at, at higher level policies, making it easier for network administrators to describe what they want the network to do and to synthesize the configuration of the network from it. One level lower, to allow the distributed collection of routers in the network to figure out what is the right way to send traffic by solving together a, a single central optimization problem. And then finally, getting the data out of the underlying devices that we need to make sound decisions about the network. I'm going to describe these in chronological order. So actually, the middle project took place first. I'm going to talk about that one first. But in each of these, what I'm going to do is talk about the problem we looked at, kind of a brief synopsis of the research result, and a little bit of the sort of human side of the lesson of how the collaboration worked. So in, in each of these projects, there was a set of other people involved in programming languages, in optimization theory, or in theoretical computer science in the area of compact data structures. And I want to say a little bit about how those collaborations happened and, and uh, what made them possible. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit more in anonymized terms about less successful interdisciplinary projects I've been involved in and, and what went wrong uh, in, in those projects. But just to start at the middle, um, a lot of the work that we did at at and focused on optimization. Right, we're trying to optimize the resources inside the network to the prevailing traffic. And I became very interested if we were to start with optimization in mind from the beginning. If we weren't forced to solve the optimization problem the network itself induced, could we actually design the network to be inherently easier uh, to optimize? And so I engaged with a colleague of mine then at Princeton, Meng Cheng, who's an expert in network optimization. And he'd been working along with a number of other people on the idea that protocols are distributed optimizers. 
that protocols are themselves a distributed algorithm for solving an optimization problem, and that we could turn the crank the other way. We could start with an optimization problem and generate the protocol that corresponds to it. So the jumping off point was the projects that I had been working on at at and just before joining, where we were really thinking from the network operator's perspective of how to optimize the flow of traffic inside the network. There, we couldn't change the end hosts. We couldn't change the routers. The end hosts are sending traffic in whatever way they're going to send. The routers are computing shortest paths. And the network operator can only observe the offered traffic and tweak the routing protocol so that the routers, in doing their own computation of shortest paths, might compute sensible paths through the network that balance load. But the more general question is, how much traffic should be sent and over what path? And what is the right division of labor between the senders who are adapting their sending rates, the routers that are computing the paths, and the network operator that's trying to minimize congestion? And the way that this was being done at the time was essentially without any, any interaction, any cooperation between these three parties. And so and hosts, using the TCP or transmission control protocol, would adapt their sending rates based on observations of network congestion. When your packets get through quickly without getting lost, send more. When they get lost or delayed, send less in order to avoid overloading the network. And the network, in turn, with the operator's help, would be monitoring the overall network-wide offered traffic and re-optimizing the routing to direct traffic over less congested paths. And so there's a bit of a control loop happening here if these two systems operate independently. Congestion control is changing the traffic in response to observed congestion. Traffic engineering is changing the routes in response to observed congestion. And they're each optimizing a slightly different thing. And so several things go wrong here. There's often a, a time scale separation where traffic engineering was taking place on the time scale of hours or days. So there was often slow adaptation to decouple these two control loops. And also a sort of one-size-fits-all view where the network administrator would be trying to, in general, just minimize congestion rather than realizing that different applications over the network might have different notions of utility for what they want the network to do. So we took inspiration from a body of work that came out of work from Frank Kelly and Stephen Lowe and others uh, looking at protocols as distributed optimizers. And so I'm going to just walk you really briefly through, uh, through the basic idea in that work that focused a lot on TCP itself. So the idea is that the transmission control protocol is solving a, an optimization problem where traffic is being sent over a route at a particular rate from a particular sender. And the idea is that sender wants to send traffic at a higher rate to get higher utility, but with diminishing returns. So as the sending rate is higher and is delivered over the network, the user's happier and happier. But they're the most happy when they go from getting nothing to getting a little bit more. And gradually, there's diminishing returns as they get uh, higher and higher bandwidth. This is sort of a, a concave curve of utility. And the, the beautiful work that, that, that Stephen and Frank Kelly did and others was to recognize that what TCP is doing, even though the early designers of TCP didn't realize it, was solving a utility maximization problem, where you're essentially trying to maximize the total utility over all senders subject to these curves and subject to constraints on the capacities of the link. In other words, if we have two flows, one and two, they're going to have to share that link uh, L that has some capacity CL, and they should do so in a way where they maximize the total utility across the two users, giving each of them the bandwidth, whoever needs it most, relative to, to the utility. Uh, this would have been back, um, let's see, around the early 2000s. Yeah, because in, in 99, 2000, we, I chaired an ISAT study looking at the future of probabilistic models of, on the internet. and. Scott Schenker and a whole gang was saying, don't touch and don't think about TCP IP. We don't know how it works. If you try to do coordinated controls, you're just going to mess things up. So let's just go with the lightweight approach. And that was the kind of theme back then, like stay away, hands off, you know, the cross at a distance. Don't optimize, just go away. And I guess things have cha changed in the early 2000s. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think basically at the beginning, it changed in a way of being reverse engineering. It was like, hey, we have this sort of cottage industry of various versions yeah. of TCP, all named after geographic locations, TCP Reno, Tahoe, Madison, et cetera. All of these were eventually reverse engineered to fall in this framework. <clears throat> it's actually a really beautiful body of work. And the, the, they all differ in exactly what shape that utility function has. And there's a really beautiful connection to the notion of alpha fair utility functions and network economics. And all the different variants of TCP that are prominent have been translated into what number alpha uh, best describes the utility function. It's actually quite lovely. And I don't think it's a coincidence. I mean, the, the, the hackers, if you will, that got TCP working without the benefit of this, this theory were doing something based on intuition that kind of mimics it. But it's really lovely that it, there's sort of a collapsing of the, the literature on TCP into this nice, uh, this nice framework. 
Uh, so the basic idea, at the time I joined Princeton, a number of people were starting to turn the crank the other way. Right? Can we start with this you know, definition of utility functions and generate new versions of TCP? And Stephen Lowe generated one called FAST that uh, gave TCP for really long distance networks where you have you know, very slow feedback coming back from the network and so on. So the jumping off point for me and Meng was to think, well, what if we wanted to control not only the sending rate but also the path? So we wanted to solve the entire traffic engineering problem in a unified way. So what we started with was very much the same, same idea. The only thing now is we have an extra degree of freedom. Instead of controlling the sending rate on a given path, we have the ability to control sending rates on multiple paths on behalf of a single sender. So we still want to maximize the same notion of utility, but the routing itself is a variable. So there might be, let's say, in this case, two paths through the network for the sender, and I have the option to set the rates on both of these paths so that the total utility is defined by the sum of them, and I want to be able, again, to arbitrate who gets access to which paths and at what rate collectively. So think of this as trying now to solve the traffic engineering, routing, and congestion control problem in a single unified way. And so what did we do? Well, we, we used the same kind of optimization decomposition techniques that the previous work on TCP had used to translate that single central optimization problem into a distributed solution. And the form that it takes is that every link computes a price based on its observed own local observed load. That's an indication of the amount of loss, for example, taking place on this link because the link is over capacity. Imagine sending up that feedback to the sender, and the sender will solve a local optimization problem to update the path rates. Basic idea, think of it as I want to send more because I get more utility when I do, but the more I send, the higher the price I pay because the price I pay is the load I send times the price of the path I'm on. And so if my path is expensive, I'm going to send a little bit less because I'm only getting a little bit of marginal increase in utility as I send more, and I'm paying a higher price. So every link is locally computing prices. Every sender is locally solving an optimization problem to find the sweet spot between sending more to get more utility and sending less to pay a lower price. Yeah. And how sensitive are these solutions and parameters to the assumptions about the utility curves? And do you measure utility directly? Do you measure the curves directly and use them in the optimization? Or do you just assume the curves parameters? We're, we're starting with a we're, we're designing with a particular utility function. Right, so, so how sensitive is what you do to the assumptions of that curve? It is, it is relatively sensitive. You want to pick something that has the, the shape you want because the converge, as long as the optimization problem is convex. Yeah, no, I imagine good, convex is a given, but yeah. when it comes to the parameters of the curve, um, is this very sensitive to that? And you have to check that and actually we just go with the assumptions and so there, there is a sensitivity. I'm not sure I'm getting quite at, the, at your so question. Sensitivity but there, to, to, to the there is a sensitivity yeah. in convergence time. Uh, and that, that was one, and I'll come to that in a, in a few slides, that the sort of um, brute force kind of approach of just doing decomposition and, and running ends up being quite sensitive to, uh, it can often converge very slowly, uh, even though it is sort of provably optimal and, and will converge, it might converge very slowly. And so we found that sort of straightforward application of this technique didn't, didn't produce effective results by itself. Yeah. So... So the basic idea then is now we've got a single central optimization problem that's being solved by each of the links and each of the senders doing its own local computation. So the next question we cared about was, well, what if we have multiple classes of traffic, each with different uh, performance goals? So you might imagine some traffic cares about throughput, some cares about latency, and you might have different utility functions for those different traffic classes. And you might imagine that the links have a share of bandwidth allocated to one and a share of bandwidth allocated to the other. Think of this as like a, a green virtual network for the uh, latency sensitive traffic and a red one for the throughput sensitive traffic. And you might imagine a straightforward extension to the utility function is you want to maximize the aggregate utility across the two classes of traffic. So again here, we can turn that crank of decomposing this optimization problem now in two steps. One that separates the two utilities from one another, subject to their local link capacity shares, and a second on a longer time scale that decides what fraction of each link's capacity should be devoted to each one. Think of this as sort of a form of adaptive network virtualization. The topology is virtualized, but the bandwidth allocations between the two classes are being dynamically adapted based on who needs it more to be able to achieve their utility goals. So again, same basic idea that now we can essentially design the same protocol we would have run had this uh, delay sensitive or throughput sensitive traffic been the only traffic class in the network, but, but we can arbitrate between them by dynamically deciding what shares of bandwidth they each get. So that was sort of the, the second step. Now, I think for me, the, the lessons here, one was 
uh, the idea that the protocol should be solving a well-stated problem. This sort of sounds obvious in hindsight, right? But a lot of networking protocols were designed without a really clear specification of what problem they were solving, and in particular, what global problem they were solving rather than the local problem a particular sender might be interested in. And then to use techniques for, for decomposing the problem. And this gives us, I think, both a better understanding of how the protocols work and when they work, and also guarantees that come from that on optimality and convergence and so on. But in practice, as, as Eric's question already hinted at, uh, that isn't quite enough, right? The process itself is inherently iterative. We didn't really come to the solutions we did in one step. And so there's sort of a, a human lesson here and then a few technical takeaways. Uh, one I think of is sort of research as decomposition, which is this is sort of the way the work between Mung and I would go. I would say, I need the network to solve this problem. He would say, the math is too hard. And, and, and this is great for Mung because instead of Mung going and working on a hard math problem, he would turn back to me and say, change the problem so the math is easy. Uh, he likes to, he liked to put it as, if you're the professor and the student, you write an easy exam. Right? So, so it was my job to figure out if I could change the constraints that I thought the network would have to impose and, and relax them in some way to make the problem easier. And then Mung would eventually say, thumbs up, it's convex, I'm happy. Uh, we can we can apply standard optimization techniques to to solve the problem now. So the art in this work was not the math. Quite the opposite. The art was in not making the math hard. So just to give two examples of where that concretely came up, um, one was that we found when we did the sort of standard decomposition approach, we did get something that was optimal and converged, but it converged really really slowly. And so we actually changed the utility function we were using accordingly to make it a little bit quicker in adapting to congestion. In particular, instead of looking just at utility, we also looked at a penalty function that penalized links that were getting close to their capacity. This problem on the left, maximizing utility, was what, uh, what TCP congestion control was doing. Minimizing this penalty was actually what the network operators were doing in doing traffic engineering. So there's sort of an interesting coming full circle here that in some ways both sets of hackers were right. Right, maximizing utility and keeping a, keeping a damper on congestion uh, both end up being important. And once we decomposed this problem, we ended up with something that not only was provably optimal and stable, but converged much, much more quickly because it gave an early warning when the network was getting into an unhappy place, rather than waiting for all hell to break loose beforehand. And a second example, when we're looking at that cl multiple classes of traffic, I described it as if there are sort of two separate virtual networks, each with its own share of resources. But when we started, we envisioned there being one queue, uh, one capacity for the link, and the traffic mixing together. But in practice, that made the optimization problem impossible to decompose, because the utility of one traffic class was really intertwined with the utility of the other. To put that in kind of concrete terms, delay-sensitive traffic would be suffered, suffering uh, delays in queuing because the throughput-sensitive traffic would drive the, the links to very high levels of utilization. And so we found to get the optimization problem to decompose, we had to have separate queues uh, with, on, a, on a longer time scale with the scheduling, the scheduling of them changing to accommodate you know, who needed more utility. And that came out of just observing that the math was really hard uh, if we didn't uh, make that separation. So that's a perfect example where Mung said, can't do it, but if we actually could separate these two traffic classes and make their utility functions less dependent on some time scale, uh, we can. A, a sort of more human lesson uh, here is also, of course, anybody who's ever been a graduate student in this room knows that research never works this way with faculty actually talking to each other uh, on a regular basis. So, so you should already be quite suspicious that I haven't told you the whole story, which is, of course, uh, the, the student in the room was, was critical because she was able uh, to connect with both of us and to really you know, wrangle us and get expert, enough expertise in both topics of network hardware and software constraints as well as, as the kind of optimization techniques involved to be able to actually make this work happen. Now, for me, a great frustration, this work happened about 10 years ago, is it was really hard to get it deployed because, again, we are still stuck with the problem I mentioned at the beginning that we can't change the equipment inside the network. So we could do experiments, we could do simulations, but we couldn't deploy. And now we're actually just starting to have the kind of programmable switch hardware, and I'll talk more about these kind of uh, switch, switching capabilities a little later in the talk, where now it actually is possible to deploy these techniques. And I'm starting uh, to work with folks at AT&T, sort of again coming full circle, who are interested in doing a deployment of some of these ideas to see if they might be uh, suitable for, for their backbone network. So, so that's sort of the end of the first part of the talk. If we want to maybe stop here, if people have comments or questions before before I go on. Yeah. So you mentioned the optimization as being the, the, the talent you were looking for to mix with networking. But it seems that there's a, there's a big um, 
third bubble coming in, mechanism design in economics. Um, yeah. Which is kind of a different way of thinking about distribution of effort and and credit assignment and payment and so on. I'm curious if if that's still an area that's waiting pregnant with results in this space or? Yeah, that's a great question. So th I, yes, I think so. And I, one, one piece of work I don't have in here that it had that flavor was looking at how the different domains that make up the internet interact with one another because their economics obviously play a direct role. Entire autonomous systems, entire networks are sort of rational actors yeah. making best responses based on what their neighbors do. And there the language of game theory is a, is a beautiful fit. And it's, it's sort Wait, of perfect. Is it, is it an area that's wide open now or is it people in, in the in the 15 years by while I was asleep at the at the switch, <laughs> per se, um, right. that's been happening. Also, that's been a field that's been moving, that I've been tracking. I think some. I mean, particularly in the area of interdomain routing, I think so. I think also in areas around spectrum management, or in dealing with scarcity of IP addresses, there's sort of been little pockets of networking where we've seen game theory come to play. I think there's a great opportunity to do more there frankly, because I think a lot of the research on game theory has understandably focused on, particularly the computer science work on game theory, on some of the theoretical machinery. And there hasn't been as enough of a meeting of the minds with uh, practical problems. But even in the problems you're putting up here, the first reaction is, yes, the first approach would be to basically try to do optimization of various kinds. Yeah. And classical models looking at the whole system. But then there's this kind of this whole distributed world of rational actors, which would be like a, a second generation approach to thinking yeah. Large-scale populations of actors as nodes and messages, for example. And I'm just curious if that's wide open right now. I think it's, I think it's midway open. I think the reason it doesn't come up here as much is because we're focusing on single administrative domains yeah. where, every, where social welfare maximization is a reasonable model. Yeah. But certainly spectrum auctions, any, any sort of distributed scarce resource, I think it's, uh, it's very cool. And I think another, another thing that's interesting here is a lot of the work on game theory doesn't think as richly about dynamics as, say, work in distributed computing does. Yeah. And yet a lot of the distributed computing work doesn't have the same sort of take on rational actors. So there's, a, yeah. I think, a, a ships in the night problem there where those two fields could, yeah. could be closer together than they are. Yeah, great question. Other, other thoughts? So I'll talk about the, the second piece of work. So one thing that was comfortable for me in this work with Meng, while I'm no expert in network optimization, I'm at least familiar with sort of the language of optimization. The next project was a little bit out of my comfort zone, which is working with folks in programming languages. And, and the jumping off point for this work was that there was a lot of interest uh, you know, around 10 years ago in moving towards a more central model of network control and management, software-defined networking, as was mentioned in the introduction. It was something we started working on a bit uh, when I was at AT&T, and it became more prominent when OpenFlow came around. And so we became interested in the question of how should network administrators describe to the network uh, how this, in a central way, how they should describe how the network should actually behave. OpenFlow itself, as I'll talk about in a moment, is not a linguistic formalism. It's like assembly language. It's better than microcode, but it's still pretty low level. And so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about this project, the frenetic project that was done with Dave Walker, my colleague at Princeton in programming languages, and Nate Foster, who's a professor at Cornell, who was a postdoc at the time. Uh, in our groups. So in software-defined networking now, you sort of pop up a level from what I described before, and now the, the underlying network devices are largely dumb. You have a logically centralized controller that is running some sort of application that is going to tell the underlying switches what to do. And so the two basic ideas here, one is the idea that decisions should be ba made based on network-wide visibility and exercising network-wide control. And that you should do so using some direct open interface to the underlying forwarding capabilities of the switch. This is what was lacking when I was at AT&T, when we weren't allowed to change the equipment, not even the software of the equipment. This changed when there started to be an open interface between the software on the device and the low-level hardware that forwards packets at high speed. And so OpenFlow, which came out in around 2008, um, was essentially a beginning of thinking about what these interfaces to the switch hardware might be. So at a high level, what OpenFlow 1.0 the original version of OpenFlow did, was to say, well, every switch has a rule table. Packets come in, they get matched against the highest priority rule based on patterns in the packet header and the patterns expressed in rules, and the simple action associated with the matching rule is the one that gets performed. So a good example is a packet comes in, you might look at this prioritized list, and based on the source IP address, if it starts with the first two octets of one and two, and the destination starts with the first three octets of three, four, and five, then those packets would be dropped. If a packet doesn't match this pattern, it would fall through to the second rule and maybe be forwarded out up at port two, or maybe it follows to the third rule and gets sent to some sort of off-board controller. So the basic idea here, and it's actually a very cute, uh, very cute idea, is that all of these marketing terms that, that networking is frankly rife with, router, switch, 
firewall, load balancer, that, firewall. All of these things fall into this basic framework. If you match on the MAC address, you're a switch. If you match on the IP address, you're a router. If you're doing access control based on several of these fields, you're a firewall. If you're modifying some of the fields, you might be a network address translator. But that the underlying hardware mechanism is largely the same. A rule table with patterns of matching and very simple actions. And by taking that interface, that already matched what the underlying hardware was actually doing. So this is not designing new hardware, it's just opening up the API to the underlying hardware that existed at the time. And in particular, to a particular kind of memory called the ternary content addressable memory that allows these lookups to take place at very high speed by doing them in parallel across all the rules in the switch. So that was sort of our, our jumping off point that you have now this open interface to the switch, but it's still extremely low level. As I mentioned a moment ago, OpenFlow is a mechanism. It's not a linguistic formalism. It's a way to install rules and in switches and to reason about what those rules will do to your packets. But you're still thinking about priorities of rules and wildcards and bit masks and overlapping rules and, and so on, making it very difficult to actually write applications on top. And so what we really wanted to do was come up with an effective programming abstraction that would let people write their apps without having to be experts in the lingua franca of OpenFlow. And in particular, we sort of started with the question of, of modularity, the sort of age-old problem. So you want to be able to write an application for your network, but actually you really want to write multiple. You want to route and monitor and do firewalling, load balancing, and various other things. But most importantly, you want to do all of them on the same traffic. It's not you want to route some traffic and monitor others. You actually want the illusion that you're doing this on all of the traffic and yet still be able to avoid building a monolithic application that would be naturally hard to test, debug, and so on. This is sort of motherhood in apple pie, right? You want modular, the ability to develop modular applications so you can write each of these apps separately, but because each of them partially specify how the same traffic should be handled, you can't just run all four of them with regular isolation mechanisms in place. You need to be able to reason about their composition. So you can write and reason about them separately and yet still have them act as a single application on the single set of traffic affecting a single table of rules uh, in the underlying switch. So that's, that's the problem we were trying to solve. So my colleagues in programming languages like to think about everything as a function and everything is about composition of functions and sort of functional reactive programming was the area of PL that we started looking at to give us ideas. So the first idea is how can you model OpenFlow itself? So you could think of OpenFlow as a function, a function from a packet to a set of packets. So a packet and its locations, this is all the header fields, including something logical about where the packet is at this moment, what switch and what port of the switch you're at. And they're gonna do a function on this packet that will generate some set of packets. The reason it's a set is if you drop the packet, it might become an empty set. If you forward the packet, it might become a new packet at a new location. If you multicast the packet, it might be multiple packets at multiple locations. So the basic idea is you have a packet and its location, and then you're going to spit out a set of packets and their locations. And that's going to mimic what operation the switch is actually performing on the packets. Like that's sort of the, the first basic idea. And um, just to give us a really simple example, you might imagine having Boolean predicates that match on certain aspects of the packet's location and header fields, and then do modifications to the packet's location and header fields accordingly to do packet forwarding, or in this case also NATing by changing the packet's destination IP. Yeah, that's sort of the first idea. The second is now you've got this functional way of thinking about policy. You can, you can do sort of standard kinds of composition. And in particular, you could imagine the two basic ideas of doing composition in parallel and in series. So just to give a concrete example, let's suppose I want to monitor traffic by source IP address. I want to compute a histogram of the traffic by sender. And I want to route the traffic based on the address block it's destined to. So I want to route on destination prefix. Then I might have one function that tells me to count traffic depending on the value of the source IP. And I might have a second function that wants to forward traffic out a particular output port based on the value of the destination IP. But of course I actually want to do both. For every packet, it's, I, it's as if I have two copies of this packet. One I want to monitor and the other I want to forward. And in practice I really want to do both and synthesize a single table of rules in the switch that will do both. And so parallel composition does exactly that. If you look under the hood, it's ugly. You could think of this as sort of an ugly cross product of all combinations of sources and destinations and doing both the counting and the forwarding. The key point here is that the person writing the code doesn't have to think about this gobbledygook. They just think about monitoring and routing as independent entities. They may buy their monitoring application from one party and write their own for the other. Doesn't matter because they can really reason about them independently and, and snap them together in this way. 
Okay, so that's sort of the, the first idea. The, but many things, uh, many things besides monitoring want to do more to the packet than just look at it. They actually want to change somehow the way the packet is handled. That gets a bit more complicated. So just to give a, a simple, concrete example, imagine you want to build a load balancer. And I know there's been a number of projects here, Ananta, Duet, et cetera, that have done exactly that. The switches can play a role uh, in some primitive parts of load balancing. So a common thing when you're building a server load balancer, you have multiple backend servers, let's say with three different addresses, but a single public-facing address that the clients send requests to. That box may be a load balancer, and what it's going to do is select different subsets of the request to go to different backend servers by rewriting the destination IP address to send it to the chosen backend server. So here you can see this is a sort of sequential operation. One is picking the backend server to achieve some load balancing goal among the whatever servers are up at this time, and a second to actually route the traffic to the chosen backend server based on, it, by, based on its choice. And so here you could imagine a form of, like think of this as like the Unix pipe operator, right? You're essentially load balancing first, and the output of load balancing should affect uh, the inputs to routing. So concrete example, you might imagine all packets whose source IP address starts with zero, that are going to a particular public service would go to one of the two servers, and all who start with one might go to the other. This is sort of roughly dividing in half the traffic so that half the requests go to one server and half go to the other. Routing might be completely unaware of that process and just be deciding what the shortest path is to get to each of these backend servers and forwarding the packets. But again, of course, we want to do both, which underneath the hood, if there's only one rule table in the switch, is kind of a yucky mess of matching on packets, modifying the destination, and forwarding the packet as if the destination had already been modified, right? Because it's essentially smooshing together two different functions and synthesizing one that has the effect of both done in series. Okay, so those are sort of the, the two basic composition operators. And then we did a bunch of other things around abstracting the topology, abstractions for monitoring the network, abstractions for updating the network that I'm not going to talk about here. Um, but they all kind of are in the same spirit of trying to find simple, reusable, and composable abstractions for querying, computing, and updating policies on the network. So a couple lessons here. OpenFlow was an important first step. Uh, it generalized the capabilities of a lot of commodity networking devices. And frankly, for me, it was hugely helpful because I could explain it to people in programming languages without them running away screaming. Uh, one, uh, one thing I found challenging about doing interdisciplinary work in networking is our field is riddled with acronyms and minutia. And it often is just very off-putting to people that actually want to think creatively in their own field. And so having a simple abstraction to explain to a colleague without them having to know all the alphabet soup of networking was just tremendously helpful. I don't think we would have been able to do this work without that. Uh, and then from the PL community, we really got the, this sort of taste for thinking in a compositional way and for painstakingly thinking really hard about what were the right simple and reusable abstractions and continuing to revisit them as the work progressed. And in fact, my colleagues did a really nice piece of follow-up work called Netcat, which recognized that this policy language that I just was describing earlier and the composition operators are actually a lovely example of something called a Kleene algebra with test which is a long and storied history. And so you can actually map everything I've just been talking about and more into this nice mathematical construct. And it's very useful for synthesizing networks, for doing verification on networks, for virtualizing networks, and so on. So if you have any interest in this space, the NetCap paper from Nate Foster and Dave Walker and, and uh, Dexter Cozen and others, it's a really lovely paper. Um, so so that, that essentially built on top of uh, recognizing that the abstractions we had already built actually were not entirely new. They really had a very nice mapping into some existing ideas. And as I mentioned, we also kind of came back to that whole control loop that I've been obsessed with ever since I started working with Albert, that we want abstractions for measurement, for making decisions, and finally for doing distributed updates to whole collections of switches as if it happens in one fell swoop. And so there is a body of work uh, focused on that also. The, the human lesson here, uh, one was, was really Nate. I mean, so Nate did a postdoc with me and Dave. Uh, at Princeton for a year before he went to Cornell. And he basically was embedded in my group, uh, sitting with networking people, absorbing networking lore, writing lots of painful code on the early OpenFlow controllers of the time, experiencing pain, and reflecting on that pain. So this was very much a learn by doing kind of project. There was a, an open source network controller called Knox that uh, was an enabler there because we could get started trying to build real applications and then reflect on what was painful, what kind of you know, repeat code we had in multiple places. And a lot of that allowed the abstractions to follow. 
Um, and finally, there's been a lot of work by Nate, uh, largely by Nate, but also to some extent by me and Dave, on creating software that other people could use, tutorials, summer schools, keynote talks in each other's conferences, publishing in each other's conferences that I think helped a lot in creating a community of people that were able to build on this work. And now we've, we see in both PL conferences and networking conferences a significant number of papers in both. Just as an anecdote there, the second PL paper that, we, that was sent to Popple in this space, the reviewers came back saying, there's already been one paper on programmable networks. Aren't we done? And I think we don't get that anymore. And I'm sure in networking, now I hear people complaining, hey, a third of the conference is on PL now. Like, you know, you know, so I think there, there's definitely been some misunderstanding of how rich the problem space might be. But I do think we're sort of over a hump now where people appreciate that there's some really rich and interesting work to do at the intersection. Yeah. Yeah, so I saw Nick talking about P4. I hope you weren't that reviewer. What's that? No, I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> now, I saw Nick talking about P4 um, and verifying P4. And I'm curious... It, it seems like my understanding of sort of where this language went um, was it got to sort of like the C programming level of specifying, the, you know, which is a much higher level than you started with, but it's not at the level of sort of like there's contracts and you can verify aspects of the program statically, essentially. So I'm curious, if, do you think that, you know, things went far enough or, or, you know, is there more room here? I mean, are we kind of at a point where the network community says, the community says, yeah, this is this is good enough for us. It's sort of high enough level. Or do you think there's still room for you know, you know even raising the, the? Oh, I completely agree that there's room to go further. I mean, even programming in something like Frenetic, the language we created, is quite low level. And in particular, when I talk to companies who are not software companies of their own, you know, not Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and so on. Uh, they, they find this doesn't solve their problem. It might be under the hood in something that solves their problem, but it's much lower level. They want to talk about service level agreements and mm -hmm. you know, high level specifications of con exactly what you just said. So I do think there's an exciting opportunity there to come up with languages that talk about that and maybe synthesizing under the hood uh, things that can, can be compiled to lower levels. A second thing we, we really haven't done that's really important is many of these abstractions give the programmer a lot of power, but not a cost model. I gave a talk on Frenetic at Google, and the first thing I heard it from the people at Google is that if you give people a programming interface to the switch, they will bring down your network. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so, so clearly there's a need to give people capabilities for reasoning about the overhead of the operations they do. I mean, if you create something that creates a cross product and you have an explosion of state in the switch or create a policy that forces a lot of packets to go to the controller, that's not okay. And I think we're not really still at a good point of reasoning about the overheads that are introduced when people write these applications. And the newer switch hardware has capabilities, I'll talk about that next, that are not captured by this programming model. I think So I think there's a lot to do to make the underlying data plane richer and be able to more, put more of the operations down there. You had something else? Yeah, so I, uh, I just want to reflect a little bit on the lessons learned, right? So, and also about your sort of the thematic thing about interdisciplinary research. So I think one thing, um, so in 1990, right, so in terms of interdisciplinary research, I think uh, this notion of separating control planes with data planes was quite well established in wireless industry. So for example, this notion of having dumb access points and smart switches was there. Yeah. And then what happened is, in fact, I personally built a whole architecture based on that. But what then happened is that there was a lot of push from uh, companies like Microsoft itself to put a lot of these smarts in the switches itself. So 802.1x happened because they wanted to do security at the switch. Now, the reason for that was because it was sort of separation of labor, like who controls what. And, you know, from a Microsoft perspective, it was sort of important to say, well, if you take that responsibility, I don't have to worry about it, and so I can do the other things. Right. Now, what happened in the networking, wireline networking space was it wasn't getting any traction either. I mean, Nick, you know, you guys were doing it in enterprise, it wasn't getting any traction. It was only because cloud became a thing where you became, where it became that everybody owned their own equipment, and once you own the equipment, you wanted to own, you, know, you wanted to have the flexibility to program your own equipment because you were being sold features that you didn't really care about and you were paying a lot of money for that stuff. Yeah. So even though this is happening in academia, what is happening in the industry, in the business, is actually impacting how effective any of this is becoming. Yeah. And so I think you, you, as you reflect on all these things and as we move forward, I think that has to be a pretty serious consideration about how businesses are moving forward and what is happening there while research is being done. Otherwise, you know, you do decades of research and nobody ever pays attention to it. And I think that when that happened, when these things started to light up, even now, for example, if you look at 
the internet and wide area. It's, these things are not taken out there. So the question that Eric was asking about um, the economics of it, I think that is more on spot on because the economics drives that design as opposed to the controllability that we talked about. Yeah, and I think just to opine on what you said, particularly just to put it in context of open flow, I think what, so there's a whole body of people in that in networking, there's a whole body of work in active networking that didn't get off the ground, you know, sort of in the mid-90s, mid to late-90s. And I think what happened with OpenFlow that made it more successful was partially timing, right? There were starting to be third-party vendors, uh, merchant silicon companies that were selling chipsets for building switches. So you could build a switch without being a large vendor with its own fabrication facility. And there were cloud operators who had unique requirements and the ability to write their own code. And that was sort of a perfect storm. And I think what Nick McEwen in particular, because he was really the one who spearheaded the work on OpenFlow, was to recognize this was a special moment. And that if some effort was put in place at the right time to get the APIs in place, a lot of, a lot of good stuff would follow. And so I do think that the definition of open flow was strategic. It's, it's, not a, it's not a beautiful spec, but it was at the right time and had a right sweet spot of being flexible enough to do something interesting without being ahead of what the hardware could do at the time. Yeah, I just wanted to have acknowledgement of the fact that a lot of things that are external to the community happen which cause something to really become... Completely agree. Otherwise, you just can't be doing great work. It doesn't really go anywhere. Yeah, and I guess I sort of hinted at that a bit in the first project, which was not successful at the time in, in terms of, if you view success in, the, in terms of having successful tech transfer, because it, it was sort of in that sense uh, ahead in that it assumed capabilities of the hardware that didn't, yeah. didn't exist at the time, so there was nowhere for it to go when the work was, yeah. when the work was actually done. Yeah. I, um, I had a more technical question, getting, uh, but I think you partially answered it when you uh, commented about cost models. Mm -hmm. uh, because um, in these SDN situations, it's not just all about composition modularity. Uh, even for the examples you gave on load balancing and NAT, yep. you have to do some, at least some arithmetic, minimally. Yeah. Um, so what are the limits on you know, what, you know, are, can you write Turing complete? computations, for example. So, so one way to think about it is that the underlying switch has this very limited sort of match action paradigm that's not remotely close to Turing complete. And then the controller is an arbitrary piece of software that could do everything else. Of course, that's a glib statement because then at great cost, right? So there's sort of uh, similar to the wireless setting that Victor was talking about, you essentially have these dumb switch devices that are fast but only have relatively simple computational model. And then you've got the slow central controller that can do just about anything. Yeah. And what's happened in the last few years is a revisiting of what the switch could do. If you're willing to now say programmable networks are what I want, and I'm willing to design new switches with that paradigm in mind, then there's an opportunity to think about what can go in the switches to, to make it possible to do more of the computation directly in the switch. So, but is it reasonable to guess on this specific work that uh, you're talking about, especially with David Walker and Nate Foster involved, uh, these are fairly powerful functional so think about the whole lambda calculus available. So you could, and in fact, you could essentially view that really what you're doing on the network is installing a set of functions or a composed set of functions on the network over time, and and the software that decides what the functions should be at any given time could be arbitrary code, mm -hmm. right? And and Nate had a version of Frenetic that was implemented uh, in OCaml. We had a version implemented in Python. But essentially, you you could imagine taking whatever other programming constructs you might want for constructing those functions, and then across apps you would compose them in. And, and synthesize them. And I guess uh, Victor's earlier comments uh, tie into this because partly what the equipment manufacturers are willing to actually you know, put into the underlying network infrastructure would also put a limit to what, what's actually practical. Yeah, exactly. And OpenFlow was embarrassingly so, cognizant of that, right? I mean, OpenFlow basically defined only things that could be done in existing switch hardware. And it tried to be as general as it could subject to that constraint, but that's a fairly significant constraint. And to the question that, you know, that, that you asked about a few minutes ago, the software running above the switch is now kind of arbitrary code. So if you want to think about verification, that's not good, right? So you definitely want languages further up the stack if you want to be able to reason collectively about the entire system, not just about the part that's running in the network. But Jen, just about the open, uh, uh, so the, the original spec was pretty, because you guys tried to be very general, right? So it was very exploded in a way that the switch manufacturers didn't actually implement the entire spec, right? So we like when we talked to a lot of these guys, they were implementing some subsets of these things, as Speedo was saying. So I guess the question uh, that, is that, would you reflect back and say that maybe you were 
too general in some sense or trying to solve 20 that's a, problems that's a really good question. people? So the OpenFlow spec evolved. There was sort of OpenFlow 1.0 that was pretty simple, and then it quickly became you know, 1.1, 1.2, and so on. Yeah. And I think what happened is people wanted greater expressiveness in the switch, and yet the more that happened, the more complex the spec got, and it became the kitchen sink. Right, the original OpenFlow spec could match on like 12 header fields with a simple set of actions. OpenFlow 1.5 can match on 42 header fields and do a whole bunch of other actions with multiple stages of tables and your brain starts to explode and some vendors implement some parts and some implement the other. So what did you take back from that? Because we saw that in a very real way. Yeah, no, I think we got the, the industry got ahead of itself. And I, I, it's understandable because people wanted to write applications that couldn't run efficiently using OpenFlow 1.0. So that's the sort of other side of the coin of being pragmatic to the existing switch hardware. And I think that's why you're seeing now, you know, new new switch hardware, right, that's trying to address the limitations of functionality that... Uh, well, all these questions matter a lot to the networks for the cloud also. Which is of course, yeah. Of yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think many people found OpenFlow was too much and not enough, right? And so a lot of people started doing things in the hypervisor or in the NIC because the OpenFlow switches weren't capable enough uh, to do more. And some of that's just because they were defined that way because of the legacy chips, and some of it is it's really hard at, at line rate in the switch to, to do really complicated things. Yeah. So I think the vote's still out, actually, right? In fact, to Ben's question about programming, I think many people don't want to program the network, they want to program the system. And a lot of this work is still you know, focused on the network, right? And you'd like to think you're going to talk about the machines in a, as a pool of resources, you know, the, the servers, the NICs, the, the switches, and so on. And, and right now, it's still very siloed. So I think there's a lot of scope to do, not only to go up the stack, but to go broader as well. So um, that's a great segue uh, to thinking about the ability to program new hardware. So the, the last thing I wanted to talk about was a, a, some really recent work. So this is going to be a little bit more narrow and a little more focused on a very specific technical problem just to illustrate some of the work we've been doing on, on network monitoring. So the big frustration in, in a lot of the work that I was involved in at at and is many networking problems, knowing what's going on is harder than knowing what to do about it. And that's often because we just don't have sufficient visibility into the traffic, the performance, and so on, often working with you know, measurement techniques that are quite coarse-grained and slow. So I became very interested in how to leverage emerging switch hardware to be able to do better measurements. And that's, that's sort of the big focus of my current research. So the work on, on OpenFlow and Fornetic and so on also led to a bunch of programming abstractions that led us to rethink what we would want the hardware of the future to look like. Uh, if we could go beyond OpenFlow. And so a number of people became interested, us and other groups as well, in more programmable packet processing directly in the switch. And so I was going to tell you a little bit about how uh, current switch hardware that's coming out of a number of companies, um, Barefoot Networks, uh, Nick Cards from Netronome and Xilinx and so on, how they're thinking about what the uh, switch hardware of the future should do. The first is that instead of having a fixed set of header fields, first 12, then a bunch more, then 41, then 42, and later versions of OpenFlow, there, there should just be a parser. And that parser should be programmable as sort of a little state machine that can decide how to read the packet and which fields to extract from it. This is not a particularly deep idea. And in fact, a lot of switch hardware has this. It's just that it's not exposed to the programmer. So a, a programmable parser. And then a series of match action tables, just like OpenFlow had, but able to match on the fields that are come out of the parser and also on metadata that might get passed along from one stage to the next. Now, often the computation you want to do might go across multiple packets. And so it'd be nice to have some storage some registers, if you will, that can keep state about uh, history of past packets and computations on them uh, in the switch, and then ability to pass state also from one stage to the next. So the sort of two big things here are being able to parse, match, and act on a programmable set of header fields, and the second is the ability to create and maintain state, state across stages between stages in the switch, and state in registers that might be read when the next packet comes along. So this computational model is still pretty primitive, but it's much richer than OpenFlow. And it's still possible to run at line rate. So again, the goal here is to find a sweet spot that's amenable to efficient hardware implementation to run at line rate, and yet still as programmable as we can make it uh, subject to that constraint. And so the problem space I'm particularly interested in here is, is measurement. So what do we have here in this picture is, is a streaming platform. Right? We've got a modest amount of state, modest computational capabilities, and, and a pipelined architecture that one can do processing in multiple stages. It's a perfect fit for the problem of streaming algorithms, where you want to do some simple computation on packets as they fly by, keep a limited amount of state. And there's actually a very rich literature in theoretical computer science that goes under the name of compact data structures, or streaming algorithms, or sketches, um, that create a great opportunity to actually realize those algorithms now directly in the data plane. 
But there's a catch. The theory literature is not a perfect fit because they often assume a richer computational model than the one I just presented. And so a lot of this work is taking ideas from compact data structures and figuring out where it doesn't work because it violates some assumption of the computational model I just presented and trying to find a meeting of the minds where hopefully we can approximate those algorithms in some reasonable way while still working within the switch. In particular, we've got a pipelined model of computation. It's very difficult after you've read a register or written it to come back to it later with the same packet. You sort of have to leave behind you some, something, in, uh, something lying in wait for the next packet, but it's very hard to do repeat operations on the same data. Uh, the amount of memory involved is quite modest. And there's a simple ALU, a simple ALUs associated with uh, action processing, but you can do very simple computation, simple if then else processing, addition, subtraction, not division, you know, et cetera. So again, a very, very primitive computational model. So the question we looked at was sort of a, a very natural one to think about, which is heavy hitter detection. In my network, there might be tens of thousands of flows going through it, all conversations taking place independently. I want to know the K largest or the ones that are exceeding a particular rate of sending. And the challenge is I don't have memory to store state about every flow. So there, in the theory literature, there's a very simple algorithm. It's a very natural algorithm for doing this called the space savings algorithm. Essentially, what you do is you store a key value table. The key is, let's say, an identifier for the flow. This could be the source IP address or source destination pair, or whatever you, you define a flow as. And the value is a count of the number of packets or the number of bytes that have been seen for this flow so far. And the goal is to identify only those above a threshold or only those uh, that are the biggest. And so the basic idea in the space savings algorithm is if a key comes in that's already in the table, you just increment its count. If the table is not full and a new key comes in, you put it in. And if the table is full and you have to evict something, you evict, what would you expect? You would evict the key with the minimum value, right? Because that's the one least likely to be significant down the road. And so you would find key five with a value of one and you would evict it to make room for key seven. That's it. Yeah, that's sort of the basic algorithm. This does not work in the computational model I mentioned for a bunch of reasons. So first of all, it requires an, an order and scan of the table to find the current minimum, uh, which isn't going to be feasible. We really want to do one read or a small number of reads and writes uh, in each stage of the table processing, so we can't do this. So it's going to walk you through a succession of some simple ideas. They're going to each be natural, but at the end, they turn into a solution that can run in, in one of these switches. So the first idea. Very simple one is that you would not need to look at the entire table to find the true minimum. If you got kind of close to the minimum, that would probably be good enough. So let's look at D entries in the table rather than uh, all N of them. In a simple case, let's suppose it's two. Then when the key comes in, you might apply two hash functions to the key, look at two different locations in the memory, and recognize, well, one of these is the smaller of the two. I'll evict that. It's not perfect. I would have loved to have evicted key five, but I didn't know about it because I happened not to pick it. But the hope is that you would do a reasonably good job uh, not evicting one of the true heavy hitters if you apply the technique like that. Okay. Now, even that is not ideal because it does multiple memory accesses at a time. So a simple extension of this idea is to make this table actually multiple tables, one per stage in the pipeline of processing. So a packet would now have a, a single read and write uh, in a single entry in each stage. So you might, let's say, hash the key here and recognize that key two can be, should be evicted. And then, in the, and then we have a problem, though, because if I were to go through multiple stages of processing and look at key two and key four and then compute the minimum, I don't have the luxury of circulating back to update the table entry that has the true minimum in it. I only know the minimum of these D things when I get to the end of the processing. And I don't have the luxury without great efficiency to route the packet back through again a second time to be able to actually do the updates to evict the true minimum. I don't know at the beginning this is going to actually be the minimum because I haven't looked at the rest of the tables. So the final solution we came up with essentially does the computation of the minimum in a rolling fashion uh, in, along the pipeline rather than doing any recirculation. And the basic idea is this. I come in with a key. I look. I evict the first entry. Gee, that was a huge mistake. That's actually the biggest flow in the system, so I really don't want to evict it. But that's OK. I'm going to carry it along to the next stage where it has a chance to compete with whatever entry it hashes to. And it'll compete now and recognize, well, I'm bigger than key four with a value of two, and so that's the one that gets evicted. So essentially, by processing each packet once in each stage, reading and writing one entry in each stage, and passing a little metadata from one step to the next, can, can essentially evict something close to the true minimum, even though it's not exactly right. 
So just to think about how this matches the computational model I talked about earlier, we're essentially storing these tables in the register arrays that I showed you earlier. We're using a simple arithmetic logic unit to do a simple hash function on the packet header. We're using simple logic to do conditional updates to compute the minimum. And we're using small amount of metadata to pass along with the real packet information about its key or about a key that's been evicted at a previous stage of processing for this packet. And then the nice thing is that even though this is not exactly the space savings algorithm from the theory literature, in practice we do really close uh, in terms of the overhead and performance that one would, would get from using that algorithm. So, so that's sort of a, a little deep dive into one example problem. What we'd really like to do is come up with a more general way of thinking about this computational model and what kinds of questions can be answered efficiently using it. But in terms of the lessons here, one is just getting, at the beginning, super concrete. Defining a very simple computational model inspired by the capabilities of new hardware, a simple example problem that has a straw man solution that's been heavily studied in the theory literature, and then iteratively relaxing that design based on the constraints that the hardware imposes. But of course, we have a long way to go. We'd like to have provable bounds on accuracy. That's something we lack for this solution right now. We have some sort of simple analysis that helps us get insight, but it's not a, not a very tight bound on performance. And we'd like to have a more general way to approach a broader set of analysis questions uh, using techniques of this type. So that's sort of the, the third piece of work. And I think it's going to end with a few minutes of thoughts about interdisciplinary work. And uh, when I first gave this talk for the Athena lecture, it was to a, a largely academic community where, where I think uh, I was trying to sell people on the merits of interdisciplinary work. I'm at a place here where you guys do that all the time. So indulge me for a moment on a few thoughts about lessons uh, about that. I know I'm sort of preaching uh, preaching to the choir. Uh, so I've, I personally find interdisciplinary work you know, intellectually really exciting. You learn about other areas. And perhaps the more surprising thing is you learn about your own area. When you have to explain it to someone else who's a natural skeptic and maybe not naturally passionate about the minutia of your field. And so it becomes a nice way to learn how to articulate your own field to other people. And often real problems are inherently interdisciplinary. So it's also, as part of a broader hope for, for impact on, on the field of IT in general, it's a nice uh, style of work to do. And frankly, it's actually just a lot of fun. I've gotten to know each of the people I mentioned in these three collaborations really well. And sometimes the fun doesn't involve work. Sometimes they're connoisseurs of fine wine and food as well. So, um, but a few thoughts, uh, particularly for, for younger people in the field. Um, one th lesson you might get from this talk is that I've done a little bit of work in network optimization, a little bit of work in programming languages, a little bit of work in compact data structures. And in fact, I've really done very little work in any of those because I worked a lot with collaborators who had expertise in those and other areas. Uh, so I've been pretty opportunistic. If someone will play with me and they have a hammer that's relevant to the problems I work on, I, I, I say yes. Um, that's not always the right way to go. Uh, in particular, there can be merit in honing one's own single hammer to use on a range of problems, particularly for grad students or people early in their career. It gives you a way to control your fate uh, and to do work without being dependent on a collaborator at all times. Although it, it requires a, a bit of care because you end up having to pick that hammer very wisely because becoming an expert takes a lot of time. And you want to make sure that hammer is useful for a wide range of problems in your field, not just one. Uh, you can do what I did, which is to work by collaboration. It's riskier for junior folks, um, but it can be OK if you can define a niche for yourself involving digging really deep into crystallizing models of what the computational capabilities are of the devices in your own field. And that's sort of where, where I've tried to walk the line between deeply understanding the capabilities below me and the network administrative tasks above me and translate those into terms that other people in other fields can think about. But it's a bit more of a nebulous skill set than being an expert in a particular disciplinary domain. So it's certainly something to, to do with caution. Uh, there can also be a pretty steep learning curve. Many of these projects I just mentioned were multi-year efforts before anything happened. That was interesting um, because often there's a lot of time taken to, to learn the language of both of the two different fields and the two different cultures. And in some cases, it can be easier in one direction than the other. Just in, my, in working with programming languages colleagues, I've certainly found it's been easier to get programming languages students to do great work in networking than the other way around uh, because PL has you know, many years of training and a lot of uh, aesthetic involved in it that can be very hard to train in a short period of time. Different subsets of networking can themselves be challenging, but they're often things you learn more incrementally as you go, and you can often do interesting work without knowing everything about networking. So I've certainly found that it's sometimes easier to go from the hammer towards the nail than the uh, other way around. And one way to walk that line is to join an existing community of people, and you know, PL is networking PL intersection is an example of that now, where there's already some technical foundations, software stacks, models to think of. Of course, it's always with some risk, because if you join a party too late, it's not necessarily as interesting. But sometimes there can be the beginnings of a new community that afford an opportunity to do new work without doing all the heavy lifting yourself. 
Um, one thing I hear a lot from people is credit. How does this work you know, when you're publishing in two different venues and there's many authors on papers? And I would just say a couple lessons there. I've worked with a number in these projects with a number of junior collaborators. And clearly, one way to walk that line is to publish where it's appropriate for the junior collaborators so that they're, they're not taking the risk that you no longer have to worry about taking. And, and also understanding the evaluation processes at one's own institution so you know whether, whether the work that's done with multiple senior or multiple faculty co-authors will be valued in the, in the tenure evaluation process. And finally, I'll just note that this sometimes interdisciplinary work can make this problem easier. If I write a paper with Nate, even when he was a, a relatively junior colleague, it was really, really obvious which work was his and which work was mine. Because there's just stuff in the paper that I could never have done myself that I barely understand. Uh, now, if he was working with a PL co colleague, it's a little less clear. And likewise, if I'm working with a junior networking person, it could be a little less clear who's bringing what to the table. But with interdisciplinary work, it's often pretty easy to tell whose fingerprints are on which parts of the work. His font was Greek and yours was Korean. <laughs> exactly. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah, I remember a, a colleague, Joan Feigenbaum, I'm sure you know, once said to me, she said, networking papers are weird. They have a lot of text. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So there, there's truth in that. I did, I did, I did the text. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think another piece uh, is, is healthy interdisciplinary collaborations can be challenging. I only talked about three projects that were at least at some, to some degree successful. There are tons of projects I chose not to talk about because they weren't. And the reasons they weren't successful, uh, often collaborators don't stick together. You know, there's, it's a relationship that requires nurturing and, and also people that are willing to dig in for a long period of time before something interesting happens. And the bottom line is sometimes the work isn't actually interesting in both fields. Right, there can be an expertise I need to get my job done, but if that, that work is not interesting intellectually uh, to the other person because it's sort of routine, run of the mill, that's not going to be a lasting collaboration unless they really have a lot of patience for tech transfer. Yeah? I think even, even when it is exciting in both fields, sometimes it's hard to convince the people in your field, like, like in, in, on the intersection, like if you're trying to publish in Popol, the people who review the papers look at the Popol results. And they're not, they don't know of networking, so they don't really understand fully what the challenges are or how hard it is. So yeah. I think there's a certain amount of like, um, just assuming that you know, if it's like this collaboration, it's, it's a weaker form of the same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and particularly in the work with Hmong, that ended up being an issue on the optimization work I talked about at the beginning, because networking conferences would read it and be like, oh, there's like scary math in it. And then the optimization venues would be like, oh, this is like standard optimization theory. Right, because right. right, we were trying to pick problem formulations that were amenable to simple math. Simple math, you know, for the optimization folks, right? Because we wanted everything to be convex so we could do, you know, optimization decomposition. But in my own community, there's like Greek in it. So they're like, oh, I don't know what you guys are up to. It seems a little weird. So that definitely had some issues because of the of differences in, in value structure. And in fact, another piece of that is some communities value, you know, proofs and some value code and not many value both. And so if you want to... Uh, uh, the paper to have both, if you want to sort of make the, the more applied people and the more theoretical people happy, that can certainly be a challenge. And at a minimum, the collaborators need a shared uh, union of each other's values, if you will, or union of the, their field's values uh, to be able to make that work. And of course, engaging students and postdocs. I found this is actually generally pretty good in the sense that students often are excited about interdisciplinary work because it's exciting. It's a little risky, but it's, it's unique. and it gives them a niche to be in, but it does require more training and more patience and wrangling two or more advisors, which is always a, a challenge of a non-technical nature as well. Um, and finally, I know this is going to sound kind of weird for an internet researcher to say, but I'm a big fan of physical proximity. Uh, this kind of work all happened in person, all of it. And the unsuccessful projects were a mix of in-person and not. But it's just super hard when two faculty members or two researchers really need to have uh, airtime with one another. It's just very, very difficult to have those early stages of collaboration take place not in person. Um, this has worked for me, worked with me remotely when a student does an internship, and I've certainly had many successful projects at Microsoft of this type where students spent a summer or longer at Microsoft and made, made the bridges stronger to make that possible. But for projects where it's like two faculty members at different institutions working, it's, it's just kind of a bloodbath because people are just, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind, and it's just hard to talk on Skype or Hangouts all the time. So I'll just conclude by saying, you know, computer networking is, I've always found it a very exciting area of research because it's a, a rich space of important practical problems that affect real people's lives. And it's an intellectually rich space of really hard problems. And the sort of general grand challenge of building networks worthy of the trust society increasingly puts in them is, is intellectually enriching and has really, I think, potential for a lot of practical value. But it definitely, I think, requires uh, ability to, to bridge across the divides with some of these neighboring disciplines within computer science and elsewhere to, to make it happen. 
So thanks for your attention. I'm also happy to take questions. Yeah. Thanks for the great talk. So uh, I like the metaphor of hammer. So, but you no, know, you only know what hammer you need after you decide what to do. Right? I'm more, yeah, I'm more curious about uh, in this year how you build up your vision and how do you decide which part, which direction is better than the other, so you jump. Yeah, I think, I think in particular for the first two projects, I've always been interested in resource optimization questions. A lot of the work I did at at and was about optimizing resources and about the pain network administrators felt in getting their networks to do what they wanted. So optimization and PL, they just sort of jump out as, hey, there's pain around resource optimization and around expression. And it became sort of natural to think of those two fields. And then I think recently with these new emerging hardware devices, it's really clear that, that it's running a streaming algorithm with limited storage and computation. And so then you're like, oh, that's, you know, that's compact data structures. So I think for, for those three particular projects, it was sort of natural. I think uh, it could be harder in other areas, but I think it's not a coincidence that those particular problems were born out of um, networking. People are always preoccupied with problems of scarcity. Right, and problems of scarcity really benefit from algorithms and optimization. So that's just like our bread and butter. And the PL stuff was a little more of a stretch because I've never taken a PL course. Um, I've actually never taken a networking course um, uh, either, for that, for that matter, actually. To, um, but uh, in fact, actually, some of my colleagues who are more disparaging of networking think that might be why I've stayed in the field, that if I'd actually taken a networking course, I might think differently about the field. But uh, uh, yeah, so I think some of it is that, that, that I, those are sort of the most natural collaborations. I think the, Eric's points about game theory and economics, I think that's an area that's natural too, but that's tougher because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a bigger reach, I think, for networking people who don't already have some of that background, whereas some of these, some of these stay within CS. And I do think there's starting to be a more vibrant sort of mechanism design and algorithmic game theory community within CS, but before that built up, I think it was actually really hard because it's an even bigger gap to talk to an economist. Like, like what is that? I don't even know how to do that. Yeah. yeah. The one thing I think is interesting about this relationship between PL and networking is there's sort of the, the history of PL and, and hardware design, you oh. know, and, they, and that, that evolved over you know, like decades. And then the, you know, the networking community sort of saw that there was a potential opportunity there in a similar relationship. But they had all that history to, to sort of quickly move up and, and get you know, on par with. And I, so I think it's really it's exciting to see the kind of rapid development of these ideas and how they get applied to practice. Um, yeah, and I think part of that, going back to, to the points that Victor was making, was because there was an inflection point in the networking community with cloud, with merchant silicon chipsets, that, that changed the nature of the question. Yeah. So it was possible to build on top of something that wasn't there before. Yeah, I, I just want to sort of add to that. I think the, the, it's actually very correct. Um, for example, if you think about the cloud, I just I think you saw my blog I wrote recently. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, it's uh, it's things are getting so complicated. I mean, so complex. Um, and here, you know, we live actually in a very pristine world in some sense, where we can sort of think and clear things. I just had lunch with a, with a with a friend on the other side, and it was sort of explained to me. The other side being. Like, what? <laughs> photographs. <you> know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> The many places you can go there. The other side of it. I wasn't thinking it was like someone in prison or, you know. But, um, anyway, so the point was that, that um, dealing with that complexity, I mean, what it's sort of like, it's always a firefighting drill. It's nonstop. Like, you know, how much capacity do you have? You know, how do you sort of like move VMs around? Or, you know, how do you sort of... Like, it's, uh, and networks actually, and things go down all the time. And the problem is that if one of, like, as you know, one router goes down, one switch goes down, then you know, massive sections of the cloud come down, which means all these properties, everything comes down. So as, as we progress, it's becoming even more clear that we should have done this right in the first place, which is yep. that we should not have hacked it all together the way we've hacked it all together. We should have had some uh, sort of discipline in the way we did you know, uh, we took uh, concepts from programming, and so this is what's going on with network verification now, for example, right? All yep. this work that's going on. So. I think the other important thing, point about cloud is a lot of the cloud companies, Microsoft included, the network is just one piece of the infrastructure, and in every other part of the infrastructure, you're allowed to like write your own code and touch the code, and somehow the network is sacrosanct, and like the network's in the way, and you can't fix it, right? And so people are just offended. Whereas I think if you work at a networking company, that's just so normal to you. But if you're in a company that where networking is just one of many pieces, that's just such an anathema. Yeah, but actually, so the, what I wanted to say was so that is that will keep us busy for a while. I mean, yeah. There's no question about it. 
But still, there are other aspects to things too. Like for example, you know, latency is a thing. Taking latency is the first line. We're getting faster and faster. We don't really know why the speed we can't get to the speed of light. Like why can't we move packets around fast <coughs> enough to actually be able to get to the? So right. there are all these other things that require it. But the balance is like where our attention is right now. Right, the, the whole community seems to have that intention of you know, the availability. And when you get to things like latency and all, there I sort of don't quite have a clarity on what interdisciplinary sort of stuff can help there. Right, and, right. Um, you know, things and one thing I've not worked on that seems that. very natural also is control theory. I mean, I talked a lot about control loops in this talk, but I've actually never collaborated with someone in control theory, and that seems like a... That seems like a missing link as well, where I think yeah. the networking community, there are a handful of people who do, like, you know, like Mohammed Elizadeh at MIT certainly has done a lot of work, yeah. including work he did here that has that, that taste, Dina Katabi. So there's certainly people who do it, but I think that's an underexplored area in networking for sure, because everything we do is control loops and complex interacting ones, and when they interact in ways you don't understand, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments, questions? Great. Thanks so much. Sure. Thanks. Thanks.